It's time. So you guys can make your way on inside. Um, we're super excited about this morning. It's going to be an incredible morning. We have a baby dedication today. Woo! It is awesome. So I just wanted to give a couple of announcements before we begin in worship. Um, and so we're actually, who here knows that we're about to eat some really good food after the service? Yes. <laughs> so if you don't know, you can join us afterwards. We're going to be having food in um, the cafe. We're going to, it's, it's called First Sunday Family Feast. And this is our very first week doing it, but we're going to be doing it every single month. So every first Sunday of the month, it's going to happen. And it's just an opportunity to gather and chat and hang out and eat some food, which is awesome. So I just want to also remind everybody that the, the family room is now open. Yay! So for those of you who have little ones who normally go to the nursery, the nursery is now not going to be open until um, the rest of the kids are released. Um, it'll be open after, uh, after worship. And in the meantime, there's a family room in there. If you don't have diapers or whatever, there's a couple extra things in there for you if you need, and a changing table, and some privacy um, with a feed to the service today. So um, you can go in. It's right next to the um, communication desk. So coming up is the men's retreat. Woo. Yes. Do I have Rick? Is Rick in the house? Okay, so the men's retreat, if you have... Um, if you guys, if you ladies have any men you can think of, or if you, if you men are looking for a deep, intimate connection with not only the Lord, but other men, um, if you're feeling a little bit like the, the culture around us has infiltrated your house or your home, this time is for you. It's a men's retreat. Um, I know that Rick uh, went down south into Indiana, and it changed his life forever. And they're actually going to be doing it at Camp Aniasa this year. They're bringing uh, the retreat to us, which is really amazing. So if you have not signed up yet, um, please do. You can do the QR code, and there are also flyers on the table out there. So if you know of anybody else in any other um, either family members or anybody it's else, grab called some. Battle cry. Yes. So if you go to ba is it battlecry.org, Rick? Battlecryinternational.org. If you yes. want to look it up and find more information. Okay, awesome. So the next thing on the announcements is children's ministry training. So we are super excited because the children's ministry is going to be, we recently had a whole bunch of you guys volunteer, which is the best thing ever. Such a gift to the next generation, and we're so thankful for you guys. So we've put together a training, and it begins next Sunday after the service. We're going to have some pizza. And we're also going to have some gluten-free options for those who really have dietary needs. <laughs> So, well, there's still time. I mean, I'll, I'll just, just volunteer, volunteer for a pizza. pizza. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll put you on this schedule, Chili. For um, pizza, I think. No, for volunteering. Uh, <laughs> I'm good. So, but the children's ministry volunteering is, is going to be every other week. There are going to be three training days, and we're just going to spend some time together and equip ourselves to really um, be ready for what's coming because the Holy Spirit is coming in a powerful and mighty way downstairs. We've seen visions, and we've heard words from the Lord. It's going to be insane. And so we want to just equip ourselves to be ready for that. Um, so if you are interested in finding out more about what's happening at Praise Fellowship, you can go to Praise fellowship.net and find all the events and the information. So at this time, if you guys can stand, we're going to pray. Holy Spirit, we just invite you into this place right now. Jesus, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and there is no one like you. We make room for you today. We step aside and say, have your way. 
Jesus, we declare your authority and headship over this house of praise. You are our shepherd and our guide. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that there are new mercies today for us. We love you and we praise you. Just take a couple of minutes and we're just gonna give him some thanks. If there's anything, anything that's happened this week that, that you could be grateful for, whether it's just the meals that you've had, being able to eat food, let's just give him some thanks and then we're gonna worship him. to the Lord, to him who rides in the ancient highest heavens. Look, he thunders with his powerful voice. Ascribe power to God. His majesty is over Israel. His power is among the clouds. God, you are awe-inspiring in your sanctuaries. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. Amen. Let's worship him this morning. Bye. 
to you and you alone. You and you alone are worthy, Jesus. Me with the fire, 
just give it all over to you this morning. You have rightful kingship. You have rightful authority. Let us recognize our citizenship in the kingdom of heaven this morning. Let us recognize our son and daughtership as a family member of the great king of heaven this morning. son and you are a daughter made in his image to reflect his glory to all the world. Oh, Jesus. Every child from the youngest to the oldest. Every child from the furthest away from him to the closest to him. You're not too far away. If you turn and look at him, he is right there with open arms. I just feel like somebody needs to hear that this morning. You are not too far away. The king of glory is looking at you, looking for you. He's just saying, just turn and look at me. Just turn and look at me. And I will wrap you in my arms and I will greet you with a kiss and I will put the robe upon your shoulders and the ring upon your finger and I will reinstate you as my son and my daughter. Look at him. He's magnificent. Look at him. Jesus. Yeah. 
heart this morning. You will always be
heaven. Come on. You reign forevermore. Hallelujah. Wonderful thing that's about to happen. We'd like to invite what? what? Not pizza. No, the Myers family and all those who have come to support. If you want to come up, you can come up. Uh, this is a uh, a family affair. Come on up here. Come on up on the stage. Don't be stage shy. Summit's not. He got dressed for this occasion. He's like ready to roll. Come on, Summit. Look at you and your overalls. Amen, amen. Hi, everybody. Everybody say hi. Some go here, some don't. So welcome for those of you who don't. Uh, it's really nice to have you guys all here to support Summit James Myers. Look at this little dude. So really quick, what's the birthday? Uh, 
November 16th. November 16th. Okay, so it happened like right after we got bad. I don't feel bad about not knowing that yet. I mean, like, we just got here. Um, so I just want to get, get that out there. November 15th. Excellent. 16th. 16th. Okay. We'll make sure that's correct on the certificate. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, this is my first time doing a baby dedication, so I'm super stoked uh, that some of you, dude, are the first time that I get to kind of make this happen, and it's just such a blessing. Uh, we went to dinner with these guys the other day, and uh, it was so nice. They were great hosts, and uh, it was great getting to know the Myers family here a little bit better and getting to see this little guy uh, up close and personal. And so, uh, yeah, I just want to, you know, introduce, obviously, this is Cody, Bailey, uh, and Samuel, and little Summit. Um, it is my great joy to introduce you all in this one of our newest members of the congregation, the church family, Summit James Myers. Yes, born November 16th, 2024. Three. Oh. These parents have, to come to, or have come today to pledge themselves before God in this congregation to raise this child in a way that honors the Lord. And that's really what we're doing. A baby dedication, it's a spiritual commitment. All right, this is uh, the family making a declaration as well as a public request. And they're dedicating themselves and asking us to dedicate ourselves to assist in the training up of Summit. According to the truth of God's word and in the way that was established by Jesus Christ's example, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And so that's uh, what a baby dedication is really all about. It's us coming together as one large family, knowing that it takes a village. And knowing that um, we all have a part to play in leading by example in Summit's upbringing. And, uh, and in r relationship with this family. And so this is something that you guys are also going to be taking part in when we get to the declarations and affirmations. Um, we are going to be looking for a response for, from everybody in the room. And so a dedication and dedicating a baby, this is why it's important. It's a public statement that creates accountability for all of us. We're all accountable. We're all an important part in each other's lives. Amen? Amen. And we all need to be willing to step up and to be able to come together and lead in God and Christ's loving example and set the example for those who are being trained up. And so that's, a, that's really a big part of why this is important to do a baby dedication. In 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul said this to the church. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's our role to be imitators of Christ, and to, to lead by example those who are coming up behind us. And Summit, you are coming up <laughs> to the top, to the summit. <laughs> Amen. And so um, at this time, I just want to do a, a, just statements of dedication and affirmation. I'm going to read the statement, and I want to ask all of you to say we do as a commitment to these statements. Okay, so this is a response on both behalf of the congregation and the family to committing to the spiritual well-being of Summit James Myers. So, do you today recognize Summit as a gift of God and give heartfelt thanks for God's blessing? We do. We do. Yes, this is a blessing from the Lord. Do you now dedicate Summit to the Lord, recognizing that it was God our Father who has given this child to you? We do. Yes, we do. Do you commit as parents and as a church that with God's help you will raise up Summit in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, making every effort with patience and love, lots of patience, lots of love, to instill the word of God, the character of Christ, and the joy of the Lord into his life? We do. We do. We do. And do you, last one, do you promise to provide through God's blessing for the physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual needs of Summit James Myers, looking to your heavenly Father for the wisdom, love, and strength to guide him? We do. Amen. Amen and amen. So at this time, we're just going to close in prayer and uh, just...
seal this dedication of Summit's life to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just pray a blessing over the Myers family, and we ask for blessing and favor upon Summit's life. Lord God, we pray against any weapons of the enemy that he is trying to form against Summit in Jesus' name. Yeah. We rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus. We pray for health and welfare. We pray for all provision. We lean upon you for all uh, that Summit would need in his life, and we lean upon you to give all wisdom, understanding, patience, and love to his loving parents. Um, Father God, and we just ask that you seal all these statements all of this up in our hearts that we would um, hold each other and ourselves accountable to the well-being and the upbringing of some of James Myers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sure, I will. Hi, everybody. Oh, Jordan's giving me a lot of jobs to do just on the fly here. So, children, you are released. Yes. Look at them go. So, as we continue to go over our core values um, these coming weeks. We are um, spreading out the spreading out the love to, <laughs> to who's going to be preaching, and today we'll be hearing about one truth from no offense, but my favorite pastor in the building. <laughs> if you don't know, this is my husband. <laughs> I'm allowed to be biased, so Rich, take it away. You don't. You need that. I don't need that. No, doesn't need that. I'm mic'd up. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And in about a month, you get to hear Ann and I work on one of these together. And as we were sitting here this morning during the praise time, um, thinking ahead a little bit to that time, sometime in March, that we'll get to do that, is the last time Ann and I had an opportunity to preach together was, I think, 12 years ago on a different continent. We were in Katali, Kenya, and Ann and I had the opportunity to speak to a group of leaders over in Katali, Kenya, so we get a different opportunity to, to, in a month. Um, so as Ann said, as you're keenly aware, is we're talking about our core values, the things that drive us, the things that are integral to us as a fellowship here in Russell, Pennsylvania. And a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, I think it was, Julie Beter talked about One Kingdom, AJ and Tammy talked about one house, and this morning I'll be talking about our third core value, which is one truth. And as I was preparing, you know, the teacher in me always comes out, and we're talking about core values, and we hear that term a lot. You know, you got to work your core, right? Any of you working your core? What's that mean? Okay. This middle portion of your body is what usually referred to as the core. And if you have a weak core, what does that do to your whole body? You don't have the stability. You don't have the strength to do the things that maybe you would like to do. And so spiritually, as a body of Christ, if our core is weak, if we're not connected to the source of power and love, we have a weak core, don't we? And so a core, and again, looking into dictionary, um, a core is a central or innermost or the most essential part. Does that sound like a good thing to have at our core, the, an essential or a important part? The second definition, definition is the heart or the inner part of a thing, the heart of a matter. Okay, What is a, the heart of a matter? It's something that's central to it. It's what's driving that whole plan or that purpose. And so when we talk about our core values, it's the things that are at our heart. And scripture tells us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So if your core is filled with the world, with the cares of the world, with the you know, forgiveness, what's coming out of your heart? Those very things. 
But if Jesus is at the core of who you are, out of the abundance of your core, out of the abundance of your heart, that's what's going to speak. And then the harder inner part of the being, the second part of that definition was, it also said it's the central part of a fruit. And here's the important part of that. The core of a fruit usually contains the seed, the part that blossoms into the new plant, the new fruit. And so keep those in mind as we go on. And in Luke chapter 8, the parable of the sower, it says that the seed is the word of God. And what's the good soil? The hearts of man. And so when God sows his word into the field, when he sows it into our hearts, it bears good fruit. It bears a hundredfold because the field, the, the soil is good. And so if our hearts, our core, are fertile and they're ripe when God sows his word into it, then there's much fruit that's born out of that. So these core values that we're talking about are the fruit of God's word. They're sown into our heart. And when the core is strong, it doesn't matter what comes against you. If you've ever watched um, boxing or MMA, you know, where they beat each other to a pulp, okay, they have to have strong cores to be absorb the punishment that they take from each other. And so spiritually, do we have an adversary that's trying to beat us? To try and ruin us? And so if we have a weak core that's not filled with the love of God, with the truth of God, he's going to pummel us. He's going to knock us down and we're not going to be able to get back up. And so we need to strengthen our core spiritually. We have to fill it with the love of Christ, with the words of Christ, so that when the enemy comes, and we know he's coming, right? That's one of the promises that the Bible tells us, that if you follow Christ, you're going to face the trials and tribulations that he did. You know, we don't like to think of that as the gospel, right? The good news, but it's right in there with the rest of it, is that if you follow Christ, you better have a strong core because the enemy's coming after you. He's going to beat you. He's going to try and knock you down. But if your core is strong, you're going to be able to withstand all the fiery darts of the enemy. So think of these things as we you know, proceed on through the next you know, seven weeks, six weeks of you know, looking at the other core values is that they're all part of who we should be, not just individually, but as a church, as the body of Christ, that that's why we're talking about these being the core values of the church, is these are the things that guide us. These are the things that give us the strength to withstand the fiery darts of the enemy. Because when a body is healthy, it's active. It's doing things. It's pushing back the darkness. And Satan's not going to like that. So he's going to come against us, and he's going to try and knock us down. He's going to try and prevent us from doing what we were created to do. And so we have to have a strong core. We have to understand what our core even is so that when God sows his seeds of hope and love into us, it's going to blossom into something that we never expected or what we thought we'd, we could do. Um, last week, gave you an assignment. Some of you may have done it. Some of you already admitted to me. You came and confessed. You didn't read it. So... Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. And those of you that are new to flipping through your Bibles, go all the way to the right, find the book of Revelation, go back a few pages to your left, go through um, <laughs> Peter, James, John, and then you'll find Hebrews a little bit back to your left. I um, guess I should turn there too. And if you've got a concordance, go even further to your left. But Hebrews chapter 4. And we're going to read out of verse 12 in a little bit. Um, core value, today's message is one truth. And the actual statement that we've assigned to that core value is that the core value of one truth is to know and study God's word as the living and powerful truth with which we build our lives on. His word is our core. It's our foundation. And if his word is your core, you can endure anything. Amen. So in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12... It says, for the word of God is living or quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 
So we're told that that's what the word of God is. It's living. It's not just a bunch of words put down on pages. It's living. And how many of you have read a scripture, your favorite passage, and the 32nd time you read it, it's like all of a sudden you've read something you've never seen before. It's like it comes to life. It slaps you up alongside the head. It gets your attention. Whatever happened at that time, that verse that you've read time and time again, there's that moment when you read a scripture and it's just something new just pops out of the page at you. That's because it's living. Because it's not just words written on a page. It's the word of God. And it's living. It's quick. It's powerful. It transforms lives. It saves lives. It's not just a book to carry around and make people think you're intelligent. It's the word of God to empower you to do things that you never knew you could do. Um, Natalie, could you bring that first slide up, please? The other one, please. All right. So looking at this picture up here, anybody familiar with what's going on here? Turn to John chapter 18. And I'm going to read from verses 37 and 38. Jesus is standing trial before Pilate. And that's what the picture is. And Pilate therefore said to Jesus, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. And in verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? You ever asked yourself that question? What is truth? We're in a dangerous place in our society, in our culture. Is truth subjective? Shouldn't be. Because if we know what the truth is, it changes your whole perspective. But one of the things that, you know, Ann and I were talking about this a little bit ago, and I mean, I could bring her up here and she could go off on a little tangent. But have you heard the phrase, it's my truth? What's that mean? If it's my truth, does it mean it has to be your truth? So that tells me that truth is in the eye of the beholder that it can be different in different situations. It can be different today than it was yesterday. Okay. Is that truth? Okay. But that's what a lot of people are taking truth to be. They're making it something that makes their life comfortable, that agrees with what they believe, with what they're seeing or saying about themselves or even about society. And so, again, going into the dictionary, the modern dictionary, and some of you know where I'm going with that, is the, the first definition in a modern dictionary is the, it says truth is the quality or state of being true. Okay? When I was in college, one of the things they taught us is that you can't define a word by using the word in a different way. So truth is the state of being true. Okay, that tells me a lot. The second definition is that which is true or in accordance with fact or Reality. Can realities be different? So this is tell, telling us that we're allowed to th define truth based on our reality. So my truth can be different than your truth according to the dictionary. And all of you are sitting nice and still right now. Okay? Are any of you moving? Kind of a trick question, isn't it? How many of you know that at this very moment, even though you're all sitting still right now, you are moving at 1,000 miles an hour? That's a different reality than you thought, right? Okay. Even though we are sitting here and gravity has us planted firmly to your seat or to the ground, 
Every single one of us is moving at 1,000 miles per hour. Pretty impressive, isn't it? Okay. That's how fast our Earth is rotating right now on its axis. 1,000 miles per hour. So if we only base the truth on reality of what we think and can experience right now, we're stationary. That's why in our perception of reality, it looks like the sun comes up over here on our left, well, you guys is right, on the east side, and it passes over our horizon and sets down over there. That's the reality that people have believed in you know, past times, different times, is that the sun rotated around us. Is that truth? Okay, we know that it's not now. That's why we're spinning at 1,000 miles an hour so that we're having the sun change in its perspective to what we are living. And so the truth is, whether you believed we were stationary or not, the truth is we're spinning. We're all moving. And so that's an example of how when we learned more, when Johann or Copernicus studied the heavens and the earth and he noted the rev revolution, is a new truth, was it a new truth that came into existence? Or was it we just gained a knowledge of something that we weren't aware of before? The truth was always there that God, when he created the heavens and the earth, he started us spinning back then. If we read his word, it talks about the, the orbit of the earth. It talks about the sphere of the earth. And he taught us science if we pay attention. Another truth that we believe for many years is how many of you know what's inside of here? Okay, Mason, what's inside of there? Our brain, okay? At one point in man's history, we thought this was a big reservoir for mucus. <laughs> and it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, you get your nose is running, it's dripping from here. I mean, the, okay? And if you have ever seen a brain, it looks like it could, I'm not trying to be gross, but... If you've ever seen a brain, it looks like it could be hardened mucus. I mean, that's not very glorious. but So the truth that people believe for a long time, that this was scientific evidence or scientifically stated that this thing right here inside of there was a mucus reservoir. We know better than that today. You know, we hook electrodes up to people's brains and we can see the electrical activity, all the action going on in there. But at one time, the truth that people believed was erroneous because it wasn't really the truth. It's what they thought was the truth on the best evidence that they could gather. And so if we allow ourselves, if, if we as humans are allowed to define what truth is, we're wrong a lot of the time, aren't we? Okay. So wouldn't it be better to let the, the creator of truth to define it? Um, Webster's 1828. There you go. You knew it was coming, Dorothy. <laughs> the first definition in Webster's 1828 is conformity to fact or reality, exact accordance with that which is or has been or shall be. And so Webster went to a, you know, a different level. He did use the word reality, but he also said that it's what was and is and shall be. So it's not this so that we know at the time, it's what we're going to know in the future. And so he was able to take it to a different level. And if you keep going down, he had a lot of definitions for truth. Um, the tenth one in his list of the truth is the truth, it says, the truth of God is his veracity and faithfulness. And he quotes Psalm 71 22. And then the one that brings us to the whole crux of this matter, the whole crux of my message is his twelfth definition. He simply states, Jesus Christ is called the truth. And it says John 14. So turn in your Bibles to John 14. Turn back a few pages, John chapter 14. In verse 6, Jesus talking to his disciples, and Jesus said to them, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So when Pilate asked the question to Jesus, what is truth? 
He didn't ask the right question. What should have he have asked? Who is the truth? But Pilate was ignorant. He didn't know who Jesus truly was. But Jesus made it very clear in chapter 14 of John. He said, I am the truth. I'm not a truth. I'm not what you decide the truth is. Jesus said very blatantly, I am the truth. So everything that we follow past this, when we're talking about truth, what is the definition of truth? Jesus Christ. So can your truth be different than my truth? Absolutely not. Because Jesus is the truth. He's the only way to the Father. He says that I am the way. I am the life. Apart from the truth, you don't truly have life. Apart from Jesus Christ, you don't have a way to the Father. Because that's one of the things that we will be taught or that we'll be challenged with is Christianity is too exclusive. It's not tolerant of other people's beliefs or religions, is it? Should we be? Was Jesus tolerant? He was pretty narrow. He said, I'm the way. Jesus Christ said, I am the way. Nobody gets to the Father but through me. That's a narrow gate. It's not open just to anybody that wants to walk through any way they want to. You don't enter into God's presence how you want to. You do it the way Christ says you do it. I am the way. And he says, I am the truth. So if Jesus is the truth, doesn't he get to define who he is? What he is? Um, and since he's the truth, it's not my truth. It's his truth. And nothing else is acceptable. Doesn't matter what the current culture says truth is. Jesus is the truth. And so our core value of one truth is not something we can make up or define the way we want it to be. It's something that we have to look at the scripture. We have to look at the author, the, you know, the definition itself, and that's what this thing is for. That this thing right here, all you know, 66 books of this Bible, is the truth. And so if you want to know the truth, how many of you want to know the truth? And... Jordan and I were talking about this a little bit at the staff meeting, is it, you know, have him do his little monologue. But um, how many of you know the movie with Jack Nicholson, A Few Good Men? Okay, Guantanamo Bay, um, Marine on trial down there for the hazing death of one of their fellow soldiers. And at one point while the trial's going, the prosecutor's saying, I want the truth. You know, he's yelling at Jack Nicholson, I want the truth. And Jack Nicholson says, finally says, you can't handle the truth. You know, I'm not as dramatic as Jordan is. You know, but, <laughs> but Jack, you know, he says, you can't handle And that's who Christ is. We say we want to know the truth. But are you serious that you really want to know the truth? And I think that's part of God's grace and his mercy. Is that if he were to reveal all of his truth, all of his love to us at one moment, it would kill us. Because we can't handle it. We're too limited in our intellect. We're too limited in our capacity to understand true love. That if he were to reveal all of it to, at one point, it would just overwhelm us. It would you know, kill us. And so in his mercy, he gives us a little bit of time. A little bit at a time. That as we grow and we can handle more, he gives us more. But he doesn't flood us that fire hose gospel. He doesn't give it to us all at once. And so now, turn again back a few more pages to your left, John 8, 32. I'll read that in just a minute. So our core value of one truth is exactly that. There aren't multiple truths. There's not situational truths. For example, how are your sins forgiven? How are your sins forgiven? Is there one truth? Jesus Christ. There's no other way that your sins can be forgiven other than Christ Jesus. You can't earn forgiveness. You can't buy forgiveness. You can only accept the gift that Jesus Christ paid for on the cross to bring you into redemption. 
That's the only way. There's no other way. There's one truth to that. Are there multiple ways to get into heaven? No. Is there a secret password? No. Can you bribe Peter at the pearly gates as the cartoons always want you to think? No. There's one way. There's one truth to get into heaven. How is that? Jesus, Jesus Christ. It may sound you know, a little bit of redundancy, but what is the answer to every question that you've got? Jesus, <laughs> Jesus Christ, the truth. And so that is why it is so important that we know the truth, that we know him intimately. So if you're reading John 8, 32, Jesus again talking to his disciples, to the Jews in the area. He says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Isn't that a great promise? that if you know the truth, it will set you free. What will it set you free from? The first thing it sets you free from is the destination of hell. That if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're going to hell. And a lot of people want to argue, well, that's not very loving of God. God created what we need. That he doesn't want anybody to go to hell. So he gave us Jesus Christ to be the propitiation, to be the offering, the sacrifice for every person's sin. And so it comes down to, do you accept it? You know, that as you're sitting here, as you've got loved ones sitting somewhere else, have they accepted that Jesus died on the cross for their sins so that they do not have to be eternally separated from God? That's the truth. Simple truth. And in John 8, 32, um, actually I'm going to, Refer back to Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. You throw some Old Testament in here. And so when it, in John eight thirty two, when Jesus said, you shall know the truth and it will set you free, this isn't just a general knowledge of knowing something. It's not just um, words that you have to understand that are going to set you free. Because, again, how many times you've read a passage and it just was words? You know, okay, that's a nice saying. Thank you, Jesus. But then that one time you read those scriptures and something unlocks. That's where the truth has come in and made a change in your life and set you free from one thing, from an addiction, from a sin pattern, whatever it happens to be. Um, you know, just even your impression of yourself, who you think you are, is the truth will break the false impressions you have of yourself. It'll tear off the lies that you've been told about yourself. And that's the truth. And in Genesis chapter, chapter 4, verse 1, um, this is a scripture shortly after creation. Um, and it says that Adam knew his wife. And many of you met my wife this morning, Anne. So, Anne, I know you, right? Okay. Everybody happy I know my wife? <laughs> It's a good thing, right? Okay. In Genesis chapter 4, it says Adam knew his wife, Eve. Is that what it's talking about? They had a casual acquaintance. Hi, Ann, I'm rich. Is that what that's talking about? What's the next part of the verse? Adam knew his wife and she bore a son. So in the Hebrew word that's used here, it's yada. And it's talking about a deep intimacy. And seems to be a pattern that's been going on the last three weeks of the messages that we've, we've all been talking about sex. Okay? We okay with that? If God ca- talks about it in the Bible, should we be afraid to talk about it in the church? Okay? The reason that we have allowed the world to talk about sex and define sex is the p- fault of the church not speaking about it. Because if we don't speak about things that God's created and God's ordained, the world's going to fill the vacuum. It's going to talk to you about it. It's going to talk to your children about it. And so not to get real in-depth or impersonal, when it says that Adam knew his wife Eve and they bore a child, it's talking about a deep intimacy. It's talking about a sexuality. And I, this is probably going to surprise some of you, but Ann and I have known each other five times. <laughs> Five 
five times. <laughs> we have five children. And so the point I want to make with you is, now let's go back into John chapter 8. When Jesus said, you shall know the truth and it shall set you free, the Greek word that is translated there is gnosko. And it's the equivalent of the word yada. And so when you see in John chapter 8, verse 32, it says, you shall know the truth and it will set you free. It's not talking about just a casual knowledge. It's not just talking about, hi, how are you? It's talking about an intimacy with the truth that breaks things free from you. You just picking up the Bible and reading a scripture randomly is not an intimate knowledge of who the truth is. It's spending time in the word. It's spending time in prayer. Um, and again, that's where our encouragement with you guys is, is to, to know this thing. And that's why you know, when we refer to scriptures, um, I've become you know, a little better at it is I used to have all my pages marked out when I was going to scriptures with you guys, is I would have it so I could get right to it and not be wasting time. But we all need to know our Bibles. And so that's why I don't do that anymore. When I tell you, let's turn to John 14, 6, I'm turning to it with you. So I'm giving you time to find it in your Bibles because we need to know this thing. Because if we don't know this thing, it's not at our core. It has to be at the core of who you are. It has to be built into you by spending time in it, by hearing it, by you know, praising him. It's not just something that happens by osmosis. You know, those of you that have been through college, how many of you th wanted so desperately to be able to take your textbook and lay it on, lay, and take, a, take a nap on it and all that information just absorb into your brain? Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. It doesn't work that way. You have to be diligent. You have to get in there and read it for yourself. And so I want to get back to my place here. Where I so you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's speaking of Jesus. And also in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, when it says the word is living and powerful, it's not just referring to a bunch of words put in one spot, collected together. It's talking about Jesus Christ being the word. He's living and he's powerful, but he's also, he is the word. And so when you read his word, you're encountering his living presence. You're encountering his power to transform your life. So when you open up the scriptures, when you come here on Sunday mornings, we tell you, you know, constantly, come here with an expectation. Don't just come here because it's Sunday morning and that's what we do on Sunday morning. Come here with an expectation that you're going to encounter Christ in a way that you may never have encountered him before. Amen. And that when you hear the songs being sung, that you're not just singing words that happen to be up on the screen. You're allowing them to touch your heart. When we're referring to scriptures, when we're you know, giving messages, don't just listen. Okay, that was nice. But how does it apply to my life? How does it change who I am? Because we're, we're not... If you're happy with who you are right now, don't be. Because the time that we spend on this earth were to be transformed into the image of Christ. And so if you're not fully into the image of Christ today, what are you doing to make yourself a little more like Christ today? Tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday. Every day we should be working on digging into the word so that we can truly know who he is. And it talks about his word being living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Is That tells us that his word can go in between our soul and our spirit and cut out the things that shouldn't be there. The diseased parts of us, the unhealthy parts of our spirit. That's what his word can do. It can be like a surgeon's scalpel. Is it cuts away the things that shouldn't be there, that don't need to be there, and leaves the healthy tissue to begin thriving again. How many of you ever took logic? A few of you? Okay. I think when I was in 10th grade, our geometry class, we had a section in logic. And I want you to apply a little logic right now. Is those of you that have taken logic classes before, one of the statements that um, is the, probably the only one I remember is that if A equals B, all right, we're good on that, A equals B. And if B equals C, what can you derive from that? 
that A equals C, right? All right. So I want you to think of that again when we're reading John 8, 32. It says that you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So A is the truth. Who is the truth? So that's B, right? So if A equals B, I want you to take John chapter 8 and verse 32 and change the words. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But if Jesus is the truth, can't we say, if you know Jesus, the truth will set you free? Or you can say it the other way around. If, if you know the truth, Jesus will set you free. So when you read these scriptures and there's places where it talks about the word, Hebrews 4.12, the word is living and quick. Jesus is living. He's powerful. Is change the words so that they carry the power with them. Amen. That we know that Jesus is the truth. So when we speak about seeking the truth, what are people seeking? They're, speak, they're seeking Jesus. They may not know that at the time, but you're the carrier of the truth. They're the Holy Spirit working inside of you. You now have the ability to speak the truth because the Holy Spirit is with you. And in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Who is the word? And just in case there was any confusion among the disciples, in John chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus made it very clear to them. And it says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Okay? Pretty clear. What's that talking about? Jesus' incarnation as a baby. The word was made flesh and walked among us. And so when you're reading Hebrews 4.12 again, you can say, the word is living and powerful. Jesus is living and powerful. Amen. So one truth is our core value. Jesus Christ is the truth, and he should be our core, our foundation of living out this lifetime. That the time that we have left on this earth, with Jesus at our core, nothing that comes against us can defeat us. Nothing can discourage us in Christ if he's at our core, it'll change your life. Just sometimes you're just turning the, the mindset a little bit on what the truth is and not accepting what the world defines the truth as. Because again, we've already talked about the world thinks truth is. It's adaptable. It changes to what they want it to be. So the world's definition of truth is actually what in most cases? Bring that other slide back up again, Natalie. Because if it's not the truth, what is it? And who do we know is the father of lies? The adversary of our soul. The one who wants to come and defeat or destroy everything that God has built. You know, he's built this body. He's built each one of you into his likeness. He's created you in his likeness. And so Satan wants nothing more than to destroy you. And so if he can get you to compromise the truth or to change the truth or adapt the truth to how you think it should be or how you're comfortable with it being, then he's succeeded. And that's where the import of us gathering together, of getting to know, know each other, Ganasco, is to have an intimate knowledge of each other in a way not, you know, when we're talking about between a husband and a wife, that's one thing. That's a different level of intimacy that we're talking about. And that's ordained by God. Again, or, God ordained sex to be within a covenant marriage. That's the only place that it's acceptable in God's eyes. But when it talks about us knowing each other as a fellowship, it's still talking about an intimacy where we open up ourselves, we, we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, that we share with each other the struggles that we're going through, the things that, you know, we even question. And it's okay to question God, isn't it? You know, the scriptures are filled with different questions that the followers, the believers, even in the Old Testament of people questioning God, what did you mean? What's your intention? Why did you do this? You know, the Psalms are filled with David's heart being poured out, questioning God. God's not afraid of your questions. God encourages your questions. Because he has the truth that will set you free from the lies that you've believed. And this morning in the you know, prayer time before the service started, um, one of the things that came out was 
How many of you have ever spoken lies about yourself? How many of you had lies spoken about you? Have anybody in here, have any of you been told that you're worthless? That you have no value? Any of that true? Okay, so if it's not true, it's what? And what we need to do is we need to repent of believing lies, forgive those that have lied about us, and replace it with the truth. And the truth is Christ. What does the truth say about you? The truth says you're worthy. That the work that was done up there on the cross says to every single one of you that Jesus said, I loved you so much that I'm willing to die in your place. Because every single one of us deserves to die because of our sins. We don't deserve his forgiveness. We don't deserve the gift of his sacrifice. But he said, I don't care what you think. I'm going to do it because you need me to do it. Because I love you so much that you're not going to make it through this lifetime on your own. That's the love he has for you. That's the truth that he has for each one of you. So whatever lies you've believed, whatever lies you've even spoken over yourself, (coughs) repent of them. Say, Jesus, forgive me for believing a lie, for not understanding or believing your truth that says, all I have to do is say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord. And when Jesus is your Lord, when he is the truth that guides your life, when he's the core of who you are, Satan has no access to you. (laughs) Thank you, Julie. The the core statements, that's what I want you guys to all come expecting over these next six weeks as we talk about the other core values is How does it apply to me? What have I believed that makes that core value not a strong part of my life? Accept the truth for what it is. It's the love of Christ. He is the love. And we all need it. I don't care how long you've been walking with Jesus. We all need a new level of his love exposed to us. We need to have that deeper intimacy, that yada, that ganasco intimacy with Christ that's going to create new fruit in you. It's going to bear new fruit out of you as you give yourself more and more over his lordship. And it's, it's a simple truth, but we wrestle with it. We protest, we, we fight it because we're not comfortable with it because this flesh that we're made out of, it wants its own way. It wants to be supreme. It doesn't want to give itself over to a lord. But Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. Nobody gets to the Father but through me. So that's the truth. That's a simple truth that every single one of us just needs to accept. Whatever level of acceptance you are right now, build on it. Look at your life. Ask him to search your heart and say, what more am I holding in myself? What secrets am I protecting? What abuse am I not wanting to be exposed because it's too painful? Jesus said, bring it to me because his burden is light. His yoke is light. And that he will exchange all of your pain, all of your sorrows, all of your sins for his love, for his grace and his mercy. That's what he did it for, is so that we could not just have a comfortable life, but so that we could have an overcoming, a victorious life in him and take what he's given us out into the world. And that's that's why we're here, is it says that when we gather on Sunday morning, it's for the encouraging of each other. It's for the edifying of each other. It's for the building up of each other so that we can leave these safe walls and go out into a hostile world. Because the world, in some cases, does not want to hear what you have to say but they need to hear it. And we're the bearers of the truth. We carry the love of Christ, the truth of Christ, and apart from that, the world's going to hell. So that's the simple truth. Um, 
let's all stand together right now. Hold on to your seat because you're moving at 1,000 miles an hour, remember? <laughs> Which is why there's 24 hours in your day, right? A little science there. Earth is almost 25,000 miles wide at its equator. 1,000 miles an hour gets us spun around one time in a day. So next week, um, Kira, which sitting right there by Jordan, will be bringing the message, and she'll be talking about the fourth core value, which is one spirit. So write this down. John chapter 14, verses 25 and 26, that I want you all to read that prior to next week, not Saturday night. <laughs> read it a couple times. You know, maybe make every night read John chapter 14, verses 25 and 26. And that's what Kara will be bringing the message on with the core value number four. When we pray here after the service is over, we're going to go over to the fellowship hall and enjoy a banquet of food. Some of that smell's been wafting through, if you've been able to smell that. But let's close this in prayer and we'll pray for the fellowship time. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are the truth. We thank you that the truth is all encompassing. We thank you that your truth is loving beyond what we can comprehend in this lifetime, but you still continue to pour into us. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are our guide into the truth, that you will teach us as we read the word, as we hear the word, Holy Spirit, just enlighten us, quicken us to know things that we've never known before. Give us that intimacy as we spend time in your word, Lord, that it will birth new things, that it will transform us. And that even you, Jesus, when you stood in your Father's presence, said you were transfigured, you were changed in your Father's presence. So every time we come into your presence, Lord, we come in expecting new revelation. We come expecting new truth to be revealed to us, deeper truth. And I thank you for the food that we are about to eat, all the hands that prepared it and brought it here, that it will be nourishing to our bodies, but that the fellowship will be even more nourishing as we get to know each other in a more intimate, a deeper way. So, Lord, I thank you for all that are gathered here today. I thank you for your body around the world that gathers in your holy, truthful name. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.